George, yeah. it is such a pleasure to have you on because I know that a farmer's life is an extremely busy life. So welcome to our Conscious Podcast. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. What a privilege. And it runs in the family, right? Farming. It does. Yes, I am the sixth generation here at Nepnik Pastures. It's gone through some change. About, <clears throat> yeah, tell me about your farm as it stands today. The farm as it stands today consists of about 140 acres of permanent pasture, grassland. Um, some of that's on quite steep hill, some of it's quite flat hill, flat land, sorry. Um, and we run a beef suckler herd, which is 100% grass fed, which means that they they just consume grass or hay or haylage, that we, that which is conserved grass we make in the summer. Um, and so a suckler herd is where we have a breeding mother and then she has a calf and then she raises that calf on her milk and then she weans the calf and then she has another calf. And so we're, we're a beef herd. So we're just producing animals for beef, not milk, which is one of the questions I get asked a lot. Um, and, and then we take everything through to finish, which means that the, the calves then stay with us for until they're two to three years old um, and finished off of, off of grass and then retailed through our website straight to the consumer <clears throat> so me. so in terms of sustainability really you are the dream farm and we will go into some more details later uh, beef and dairy farmers are really getting it in the neck you really are yeah. the bad guys at the moment is that would that be fair to say i yeah i think we've been picked on unfairly definitely yeah and and the problem is there's a lot of um a lot of negative data that comes out of, um, out of other countries with different farming practices and then it's used against us and actually <clears throat> our methods are completely different to where the data is obtained and uh, it's not a true representation. And it really does, it really so much does depend on the beef you are eating and where it is produced, how it is produced um, and how much of it you eat. I mean, vegan is all the rage right now. And many people will say, well, if you want to be environmentally friendly, you just, there is no option. You have to go vegan. I would imagine that you have thought this through and uh, have some answers for that. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I used to be worried about the, the, the threat of veganism. I am no longer worried. Um, I don't see it being... Uh, a sustainable way of producing food long term um, and, and quite frankly um, not many people can really thrive on a true vegan diet some people can but not many can there's a lot of available um, macronutrients is that are, are readily available in, in animal products that um, that you just can't get from plants but that's a whole other topic um, above my pay grade probably but in terms of agriculture livestock form a real balanced role in in a in an ecosystem that's circular and um you know a lot of the veganism um the foods the alternatives aren't produced in this country and they're produced abroad and they're probably grown in ways that most vegans wouldn't really agree with if they really knew how it was produced um and there's also you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of animal deaths involved in, in vegan, in, in plant-based agriculture as well. So there's multiple reasons, really. Um, the biggest, How the biggest does that problem work? is monoculture. Do, do, wait, pause. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How does that, how are there animal deaths in vegan agriculture? Tell me about that. So most plant-based foods grown on large scale would be grown in systems called monocultures, which is one variety, one plant. So if you imagine like, a massive area full of just soya bean and that is making the tofu and everything and so when there's no monoculture in nature there is polyculture which is lots of different species of plants of animals insects and so then they thrive as an ecosystem they all work off each other when you have just one crop or one plant growing in large scale like that it has to be really critically managed for it to survive and most of its inputs have to come um chemically or artificially and there will be pests there will be rabbits there'll be other birds um say other birds there'll be birds there'll be rabbits there'll be insects and they'll all be sprayed and hunted and killed to to not 
you know, to, to not consume that crop because ultimately the wildlife want to eat that crop as well. So there's no blood free vegan food, unfortunately. Interesting. And I picked up, I mean, your aim is to do things very differently with your farm, um, differently to intense agriculture, differently to some of the ways that it's been done in the past. And on that little brief tour you gave us, I picked up some things straight away that the, and one of the criticisms leveled at dairy farmers is this idea that the calves are taken away from their mums really early so that we can have the milk. You're, do, you're not doing that, right? How does that work? Yeah, so because we're not a dairy, because our main, our main goal isn't producing milk but producing beef, um, the calf basically stays with the mother and drinks the mother's milk. And so the mum, the cow can eat uh, relatively poor quality grass and turn that into really high quality milk, which the calf can thrive on and grow really well. Um, so we keep our calves would stay with the cows um, whilst the cows lactating for a good 10 months and then we would wean them when they're about 10 months old just to give the cow enough time to to dry her udder up so stop producing milk for a couple of months and just gain a bit of condition before she then has her next calf so just a bit of a break really but by that point the calves are ready they're eating most of their diet is coming from forage so it's very um, minimal stress and and they just carry on to then thrive on on a pasture based diet from then on. And what and and but you're still taking milk from the mothers, is that right or not? No, no, no. We don't milk them at all. No, not at all. Okay, no. Because I was wondering no. if that was if if that was a potential for dairy farmers to do things differently. There are some people operating a system called calf at foot dairy, um, so it can be done. I don't know. I don't know the full ins and outs about it. I should imagine it's a high level of management and quite tricky because obviously you, you'd have to separate the cows from the calves each day to, to milk the cows without the calves going into the milking parlour. So I should imagine it's tricky, um, not without its challenges, but there is there are people doing it. Um, so, so yeah, I guess it, it can be done. What is that level of stress when the calves are separated from their mums early? We, you know, we hear about it, but you're somebody who's much more likely to have seen it or know it. Um, can you describe that to us? Well, I can. I can describe it in our context. We used to we used to wean our calves a lot earlier. Um, so we used to wean our calves when they're probably six months old, and they would. When you separate them, they would be. They would still have access um, to sniff each other through a gate, but they couldn't get into each other's. Uh, enclosures pens um, and there would be a lot of bawling so that when they're moving a lot and it would go on for a couple of days to the point where the calves would literally lose their voice because they're like because they can't bawl anymore and um, it, it, it was quite it was stressful and then you could get outbreaks of pneumonia um, as a result because their immune system was obviously challenged um, and so since doing a, um, a holistic management course actually with a company called 3LM um, we looked at things a bit more holistically and, and we're changing the breed of our cows so that we don't need to wean early um, and and that we can then wean later. And, and we use this other little device called a, um, a nose flap and we just put it in the, the nose. It just clips into the nose of the calf and you put it in and um, it just stops the calf being able to suckle from the mum. So we do that. This is when we're weaning. So we do that on, say, Monday leave that in for a few days so then they've kind of they've got the um the absence of milk but they're still with the presence of their mum so it kind of like reduces part of the stress and then on day five so on the friday we would then remove the plastic flaps from their nose and separate them into another pen and by that time they're kind of they're not bothered because they don't want the milk anymore and they're already kind of wean themselves over those few days so we do that with very minimal balling now and we don't get any stress related issues with health no pneumonias and things like that. So a combination of things has been really beneficial. It's huge. And as a non-farmer, you know, I know quite a lot about farming and have covered mm. it in many different programs. I covered Harvest for the BBC. But as a non-farmer, immediately I feel relief that those animals are not having to go through so much stress. Um, <clears throat> you, Where did this come from for you, though, as, a, as a, you know, six generations of farming in your family? That's quite 
a turnaround for you to say, I'm going to do things differently? What, what started that for you? Well, I mean, that's, that's a, a very minor change in what we've been through. I, I didn't say, but until February 2022, most of our business was um, an indoor intensive pig finishing unit. And now we've completely flipped and we're selling um, grass-fed beef and pasture-raised poultry direct to the consumer. So we've completely pivoted the whole business. So um, I guess I'm very fortunate. My dad is is willing to let go and allow for change. And I just wanted to do something different. I just, with the pigs, I just didn't enjoy it. I wasn't passionate about it. Um, didn't see it as a sustainable future for me. And um um, wanted to find another way and, and we were fortunate that we were in a position we were able to stop um, we weren't heavily indebted and uh, we've pulled the plug and and doing other things um, so yeah change just always looking to to improve try new things um, <clears throat> make life easier improve the welfare of the animals and anything we can do generally if you improve the welfare of the animals your life gets easier um, you just have less problems and I don't like problems so um so keeping uh, so our a, I mean, up. it's all very well, you know, St. George. <laughs> but but there are other practical reasons for farming in this way. I mean, like you said, I mean, that was one small example with the calves and how they're weaned. You literally pivoted the entire business to be a more sustainable, higher welfare, different kind of farm. And that's no mean feat, I can imagine. That's, you know, that is huge. So d- driving you is not sainthood, I would imagine. As you said, there are practical things too, but what's the difference in how you feel about your work? There's so much more fulfillment in my day now than what there was. Um, job satisfaction's gone right up. Financially, we're worse off, um, but I see that being a short-term issue. Um yeah, I, I wake up wanting to go out and, and do my work now, whereas I didn't before. Um, so things had to change fundamentally. That was that, yeah, that's a massive difference, as you yeah. said. Is a, you know, and and pig farming can be quite brutal and quite intense at that in that kind of an environment too. I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are there are guys doing great jobs at it with, and they're very proud of what they do, and um, and we just. Our unit was pretty old and it was getting a bit ropey and I, I, I just didn't, you know, pigs are a clever animal and um, I didn't like seeing them in the, in the little pens with not a lot to do. Um, yeah, I just, I just couldn't get any enjoyment out of it. It's just a personal and thing, big, I guess. I mean, big, big changes like you've made don't happen overnight. What did you start with? So it all started with a few turkeys that the a few so I used to help my dad's cousin. <laughs> That's a great line. That is a great line. It yeah. all started with a few turkeys. <laughs> it did. When you go right back to the bare root of it, um, I used to help my dad's cousin who farms on the other side of the hill. Um, he used to do about 120, 140 sort of barn reared turkeys um each Christmas. And I used to go and help him at, at processing time, doing the plucking and the evisceration and that. And um he rang me up in uh, 2017, no, 2018, and just said, oh, I had a good year last year. I don't really want to do the turkeys again. My sons have got better jobs, real jobs. <laughs> and uh, did you want to Did you want to take on my customer list? And I kind of thought, well, why not? You know, it's a, it's a new opportunity. So, yeah, okay. So I took on his customer list, and I kept everything the same. I had a barn, got the same, roughly the same number of birds, the same sort of breed get them inside and, and everything pricing was the same and I, I actually really enjoyed taking um caring for the bird right from it was a day old like from when it hatched and um and then and then selling it in a box and and getting all the feedback um after christmas and and there was something i'd never had in my job before um i got a lot of fulfillment from that and then it kind of it was been growing each year and I really wanted to get them outside because we were having sort of pecking issues and I thought if we get them outside you know maybe they'd be more distracted more natural so we started free ranging them and we changed the breed from a white bird to a bronze bird and the eating qualities improved and bloody but anyway it's just kind of escalated from there and we're at the point now where we're actually fully pasture raising them so they're outside with no barn at all um 24 7 
um, being moved by mobile shelters um, out in the pasture. And it's it's just, it makes me happy when we move them into a fresh pasture and you just hear the noise that they're going in, so inquisitive, pecking all the grass and finding bugs. Um, it, it just brings a lot of joy. And so we've started building that customer list, <clears throat> customer base, with the turkey enterprise whilst we still had the pigs um and then i wanted to have another product to sell to these customers we were working so hard to gain these customers for christmas and we were only really utilizing them for that one meal a year and so i came across this guy called joel salatin who's a he's called the lunatic farmer over in the states have you come across him He's, he's, I read in your notes about him when when we were when we were talking about having you as a guest, and I thought, oh, yeah. well, that is a mentor, and I love the lunatic farmer. He's great. So he came up with this pastured poultry model where um, you get meat chickens in this little. They called it a chicken tractor. It's basically a floorless shelter, um, and you just you move it to a fresh patch of grass every day. Um, so the birds are just on pasture there's no sheds or anything and it seemed like such a nice way of of rearing the birds and um low capital cost to, to set up um and uh, i thought right well let's let's give that a go it's pretty unique there's not really many people doing that over here so it's a quite a cool story um so we started doing that in the summer and that's when nemnit pastures as a brand was really born then um doing the chick selling the chickens and the turkeys and then and then we've been adapting our beef and uh to the point where we're happy with the quality that we're getting off just grass now and uh, we're selling the beef as well so it's it's all going the right way <laughs> i mean with the with chickens with the <laughs> it'll start with a few turkeys with yeah. the, mind you i would say a few was just a couple of you know a couple of them wandering around the garden for you a few <laughs> is probably about 150 <laughs> yeah yeah. We're... With the chickens, I can really relate. I went through some times where we were rescuing chickens that were, had come out of battery farms. So instead of them being killed because they were supposedly past their best egg laying, mm -hmm. they were, you know, coming out to people like me who, who could offer them a home. Well, here they were pasture chickens. I mean, they went into their little hut at night, but they yeah. were pasture chickens in the day. Uh, that was just for their own protection. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been chickens at all if I had left them out at night here. Um, and well, we've it was really to interesting to see. And I get what you're saying about how fulfilling it is to watch their natural instincts start again. Because when they when they would arrive, they'd never sat. I did never stood on grass. I'd put them on grass, and they'd try and lift their feet up because they didn't know what it was. They didn't know how to that natural pecking behavior that you see. That would take them a week before they started even thinking about doing that. They didn't know to peck food from the floor. They didn't, you know, they just pecked at their own feathers before yeah. they started doing that. And it is really quite an incredible thing to witness that reversion back to a natural chicken being a chicken. So that reversion of chickens to natural behavior and being chickens I can really understand because watching that was one of the most joyful things I've ever done I have to say um yeah and I think we must lose a lot just by not by having birds that haven't been raised like that is there a difference in in the quality of meat as well as how we feel about it yeah, absolutely. That that is one thing we've noticed. Um, the quality is so different, um, and it's down to several factors, really. Um, one of them is it's just a healthy environment. You know, they're, be, they're outside. There's no dust. Um, they got natural light. They got vitamin D. You know, they're eating all the grass and uh, and and all the bugs and that that they find. But they're also getting a lot of exercise, and so then they develop muscles that they wouldn't normally develop. Um, and obviously, you know, we eat the muscle, that's the meat. So it's, it, and, the, and the more variety they get in their diet, the more it kind of impacts on the flavor, I guess, of, of the meat, of the muscle they're laying down. Um, and also we, they grow a bit slower because of the, you know, because they're not in a temperature controlled building. So we take them to older ages, which inherently means they're more mature and they lay down a bit more intramuscular fat. And so then they get more flavor that way as well. So it's, there's multiple factors, but yeah, the, the quality is, quite different 
um, yeah, quite different, which is good. And the quality of eggs is also quite different. Yeah, we don't produce eggs commercially. We've just got 24 hens for our own consumption. But um, yeah, they're in a little mobile a little mobile thing that we move around as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the colour of the yolk and yeah, it's just it's just the best thing. Yeah. How, I mean, <clears throat> you said that financially you're not as viable. Well, you're viable, yeah. but you're not as profitable. No. How much difference does it make the choice that we make when we're buying our meat to whether farming becomes more like your model it makes a huge difference if we didn't have the support of our customers we wouldn't be able to do it it's it's literally as simple as that i know that i could have built a new pig shed um all singing all dancing onto the bank borrow a little money built a fully slatted pig shed and there would have been people wanting to buy it. You know, I know that I'd be able to just sell the pigs to Tesco's and they'd buy them. So, you know, it's when you're doing things a bit differently and the price is different as well, um, there's more risk involved. And, um, you know, it's smaller numbers. So we're smaller batches. And so, the, you know, the, the, just the, the turnover just isn't there. But it's it's growing and, and we're diversifying. You know, we're doing open farm events now and holding barbecues and we're going to do some farm fire food sort of things. So it opens up new opportunities, but you have to be a bit creative with what you're doing. Um, or you need to try and get it to a scale where you can still remain core to your true values, but be efficient at the same time, which I believe we can get there. We're just growing with the demand at the moment. And what's the difference? Do you keep the supermarkets out? You you are the middleman, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we're we're customers, and we buy direct from you. If we want to buy what you produce, what difference does that make to you? Oh, huge! Because there's just not there's just not the spare margin to give away for wholesale. Really, um, I mean, we the amount we produce is just. A supermarket would laugh at you know it's it's minuscule it's it's all about serving our local community really um but it just it means we can we can get maximum value and it means we can do we can raise the animals in the way we want to raise the animals and still generate enough money hopefully <laughs> um in doing it you know if i if i if i wanted to pass to raise these chickens like this and then sell them in a small little supermarket and then they need to make their money on top there just wouldn't be point. There'd just be no point in doing it, because obviously, my it, it's a lot more cost costly to produce in the first place. So, so instead, really that works. on that online market is what makes the big difference for you too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, definitely. Being able to being able to sell direct online to anyone is um is is what makes it's all part of the whole system, really. Yeah, yeah. And aside from the meat, I mean, what we're talking about is regenerative farming. That's what it's known as, right? Yeah. Can you sum that up for for anyone that has never heard the term regenerative farming? How would you sum it up? Oh, great question. So regenerative farming is all about regeneration rather than degradation. So we are all about building soil and, and regenerating ecosystems. Um and that's that's fundamentally it all comes down to um, practices to to improve soil health um, and and then reduce your reliance on chemical inputs which are negative for soil health. Um, and if you can improve your soil health, it just it um, everything improves, everything gets better. The, the pasture or the crop that you grow will be healthier. Whatever eats that crop will be healthier. And then the, the, the local and the global planet, the environment will be healthier as a result of it. Um, so we, we don't use any artificial inputs now on our pastures. Um, we're just managing our, our grasslands in a more natural way, allowing longer rest periods, using the cattle to keep the grass in a, a growing stage. So it's constantly photosynthesizing and putting carbon into the soil. And what does that mean? When you say using the cattle to keep it in a growing stage, what does that actually mean? So what that means is grass, the gra- the production of grass is it, it grows and it, it puts a seed head out. And once it puts a seed head out it, to reproduce, it then starts to die. It goes into senescence. 
if it goes into senescence, it basically starts to go brown and die and oxidize, and it releases some of the carbon that it's pulled down through photosynthesis um, back into the atmosphere. Um, so that's not the most productive way of doing things. By using a ruminant or herbivore, like a cow, a horse, a sheep, a goat, anything like that, they can graze that grass before it dies and oxidizes, and then the grass will then regrow and stay vegetative. Um, and so when it's growing in its green and lush looking, it is it's basically using its leaves as solar panels to convert sunlight um, into energy. And it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and turns it into liquid carbon, which it then um, trades with the microbes in the soils. So it feeds this liquid carbon to the microbes and it says, hey, I'll give you this, this beautiful liquid sweet carbon if you give me some some nitrogen or some phosphorus, which it needs for, for different development. And then you create that relationship and, um, and it's constantly pulling carbon in, into the soil. And it will stay in the soil until the soil is plowed or disturbed and then it will be released. So if we can not plow the soil, keep it covered with grass or, or growing um, crops, then it's going to be constantly pumping carbon into that soil. And the, the, the grasslands built the most productive, deepest, fertile soils in the world. And over the last sort of 50, 60 years, we've been mining those fertile soils and kind of gradually killing them. And, um, but it, it's not too late. We can reverse it. And if I, I strongly believe that if we put a lot more arable, which is cropping land, back into grass and we grazed it, we can we can really sequester a lot of carbon and, and put it in the soil and keep it there for a long time. Um, so it's a massive carbon sink that we have huge here. Huge carbon sink, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And and it's it's such a good thing. Carbon in our system, carbon's a good thing. I know carbon, like everyone's negative carbon, you know, it's kind of got a bad, but for me, the more carbon I've got in my system, the, the, the more fertile the system is. Um, so there's something in, in our soil that we measure called organic matter, um, which is linked to carbon. And the higher the organic matter level in the soil, the, the, the higher the health status of the soil, effectively, um, the more biology in the soil. And um, for every 1% increase in organic matter, that soil will hold uh, it's uh, 30,000 gallons. It's an American stat, so forgive me. It's 30,000 gallons of water per acre. So if, if you can farm in a way that's increasing that organic matter in your soil, your, your, water, your, your soil can hold so much water, which is going to be helping with flood mitigation and, and all, these other, all these other consequences of having low organic matter soils. Well, and even in times of drought, there's a bigger reserve, presumably. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. That's right. So all of the swings that we're going to see increasingly from carbon, uh, from carbon, from global warming, yeah. i.e. floods and then droughts and then, you know, all of those big pendulum swings will be better coped with if we have a high level of organic matter in our soil. Yeah. Yeah. The healthier yeah. the soil, um, the, the more resilient we are you know and you could say that as a as a farm level you could say that as a nation level really you know if we've got healthy productive land then we should have a healthy productive nation because it all goes back to your food and so when you're telling me about how you're moving the chickens you're moving the um you're moving them around in the in their what are they called their portable sheds their track did you say chicken tractor? tractors did you say Chicken tractors. They're not actual yeah. tractors, are they? They're like no, a, they're just portable a shelters. Giant shed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when you're moving the cattle between different grazing areas, that is helping all of that process because presumably, I'm guessing that your chickens and your turkeys and your cows are adding nitrogen by pooing on the soil. Yeah, they're adding fertility, yeah. Yeah, so they're adding that nitrogen that you talked about earlier and that and that fertility, um, which enables that carbon exchange with the grass. That's right. Yeah, so an all animals would move. You think birds migrate across the world, big herds of herbivores would, would migrate across the across the country. And so everything was is all about 
relatively high impact for a short period of time and then move on and let that land then rest and recover until it comes back again. And so that's all we're trying to do. We're, we're just trying to mimic herds moving. Um, and it's, predator, it's that predator-prey reaction. So the big herds of herbivores would stay as a tight herd because they're safe as a herd um, from predators like wolves. And, and then they would keep moving because the wolves or the other predators would keep them moving. And so we're doing that, but we instead of using wolves, we're using electric fence to kind of herd them up into smaller areas, but move them every day. Um, and so then you get that high trampling where you get the grass then trampled onto the soil, which the microbes can then be fed on. Um, and you get a lot of dung and urine in a concentrated place. So it's it's very that the land just then explodes in fertility. So we're all about keeping everything moving here. It's easy to forget as well, I think, for all of us, when we look at our own landscape here in the UK and in many places around the world, which, you know, might be bordered by hedgerows or, or fences, it's so easy to forget that grasslands are a place, are, you know, a wild um, ecosystem that, that occurs naturally in nature, not because we make it happen. That's right. And as you quite rightly said, most grasslands come with predators. You just have to think about the Masai Mara or or places, you know, where there are predators who keep those herbivores on the move and herded up and behaving naturally. So it's, yeah, it's a huge thing. And I can see exactly how that works for you now. So what type of increase in biodiversity do you see as a consequence? So we've seen huge increases in, in the different numbers of plant species, the grass species, um, by allowing longer recovery periods for the land. We're letting the slower, more native grasses um, express themselves and grow and set seed um, because most of the most of the grass that's used in the UK is is like an Italian ryegrass, which is the most productive. It thrives being cut every three weeks, and and you know that's what most farmers would have on most of their fields. But like like with uh, what we're talking about with the vegans and monocropping, you could have a whole field of grass of just ryegrass, and that is technically a monocrop, which you wouldn't get in nature, and isn't really technically the most healthiest diet for the ruminant, the cow. And so by um, doing a bit of disturbance with the heavy trampling and then allowing that land to really rest and let those slower growing natives come up through and express themselves. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more diversity in, in the plants coming through naturally. Um, and, and also with the longer rest periods with, with the taller grasses, because we're grazing taller grasses as well. Um, we're getting a lot more um, voles and, and small field mice and as a result, we're seeing more barn owls, buzzards, all the other kind of like aerial predators. Um, insect life was one thing I really noticed quite quickly from changing to a fairly short grazing system to a tall grazing system. We've you, you walk out in the pastures in the summer and turn the quad bike off. Sorry, drive out with the quad, turn it off, and it, and you can just listen to the crickets. It just sounds like you're in the middle of Australia. It's just full of life we've got insects and, and butterflies and yeah it's it's quite it's it's a real it makes you feel really good I must admit you don't worry I've about got a very small meadow here probably not even well you could send over a couple of cows yeah <laughs> it probably does could do with the graze yeah. but it's the same in the summer when I go out there and it's a quiet evening and it's it's literally buzzing the whole yeah. place is buzzing so loudly and I love it because you just you, know that that life. Life is there. I bet if you um, if you treated that meadow like a lawn and you cut it every week, you wouldn't get the same amount of life there. No. We didn't. Even In fact, that's how it used to be. It used to be a very neatly mown meadow. Yeah. And now through the summer, I mow paths in it so I can actually, mm. it's purely selfish reasons, so that I can walk around and see all of the different wildflowers from summer to summer, which also are increasing in diversity. Um, but yeah, that's when I have my moment of hearing the difference. Um, yeah. and, and that's where you really notice the insects. 
Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. But I mean, it takes a mindset change because God knows what my neighbours think of me. Like we put what we're putting our cattle into to graze now was something that most people would be like, "You're wasting it all. You're trampling it. You know that should be cut for hay. You know, you you what you're doing. You're an utter." But it just once you get the reasons behind it and and you know the fact that you're trampling that over laying new seed into the ground it's um you just got to not worry about what your neighbor thinks but it's uh you just know you're doing the right thing yeah exactly it's a change of mindset as you said we're mm. hearing a lot about rewilding at the moment that is talking about an insect that's the buzzword right now yeah. um and I was really interested to see your thoughts about that and how you prefer the concept of rewinding. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so the issue I have with rewilding is you need to do it over a huge area for it to have any real positive difference. You need you need that prayer to prey reaction in a natural landscape for it to kind of be a thriving landscape. So if you're just taking fields out here, there, and everywhere and just kind of rewilding, yeah, sure, you're going to be creating habitats for wildlife. I, I get that. But for a proper rewilding project to work, it needs to be like, I'm sure I listened somewhere, someone said it needs to be like 100,000 acres so that you can have predators and herbivores and you can recreate how the landscape used to run naturally. With, without that kind of scale, um, all you're really doing is just, you know, you're creating homes for wildlife um, at the cost of not producing food. Whereas what I like to say is if we rewind back to pre-industrial ag, the way my great granddad would have done it without all the chemical inputs, farming much more in harmony with nature, there's a home for nature on our farm as well as producing food. Um, you, you know, you, you can it doesn't have to be one or the other. You you can farm and improve uh, wildlife habitats um, and 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 those ecosystem processes. Um, so yeah, I, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one because I I get the need for it and I get why people are buzzing with rewilding and we've lost so much of our wild landscapes. But there's just so many so many people on this this small country. It's it's almost gone too far. Um, to try and expect us to be able to live with wild landscapes and cities and enough food is it's it's too much to balance on such a small piece of land really and you're right you know traditionally we we do need to produce our food rather than import it for sustainable reasons we we want to produce our food rather than import it and mm. traditionally in those days the farmers were very much considered the guardians of our of our landscape and our natural world and that whole thing is and we've we've talked about that earlier has changed almost to the to farmers becoming the bad guys in some ways so i yeah. really get it it's it's not just a case of oh nostalgia they were the good old days it's actually really bold science behind what you're doing yeah and the thing what gets me the most about the whole back to the beef debate and you know beef ruining the planet is they they like to throw out the stat, the statistic about methane now, methane's really interesting because to start with... And most well, again, for those that don't know, what's <laughs> what's the problem with a cow farting? <laughs> well, this is the thing. Everyone thinks methane comes from the cow's back end, but most of methane comes from cows burping whilst they ruminate. So when they're ruminating, is when they're digesting their food. Um, but the methane produced from a cow goes up into the atmosphere, and then after about 10 years... It gets trans. It breaks down into carbon. It then, that, when it's carbon, it then gets sequestered by the plant that the cow then eats to then create the methane again. So it's a complete cycle. And unless we're altering the number of the the cows drastically, the methane production is just within a cycle. Um, as long as you're, you know, as long as you are grazing animals, and it's it's they're grazing on well-managed pastures i personally can't see the problem with it i can't see how anyone can blame an animal for ruining this planet they're not they're not mining the fossil fuels you know they are 
but perhaps and, and methane we should just add in, in case anyone's a bit confused we should just add methane is a greenhouse gas so it's a yes. you know it's a, it's something that we need to be concerned about the amount of methane that's in our atmosphere but again it comes down to how we're farming if we've got way too many cows our methane amount will go up um and if they're not grass-fed cows that carbon that methane is not coming back down is, mm. is that is that am i right yeah, I guess so. I mean, all all cows will eat grass because they're ruminants. It's it's how they eat the grass. You know, some systems the grass is only provided through through forage, through cutting in the summer and and, and siling or, or making hay. Um, and obviously, the more you do to the grass, the more um, fossil fuel that's needed to be burnt. To you know, if I'm making hay, I need to cut it with a tractor. I need to ted it out, which is to to dry it. Then I need to bale it. So all of those actions require machinery and, and burning of fuels whereas if you can go to a more um you know we're not at that stage yet but we're on that journey there's people that are completely pasturing cows and not having to keep them in in the winter and they're just relying on grass alone and that for me is the most um ecologically sound meat producing system i can think of because they're just self-sustaining um there's there's no machines involved they're they're growing the grass themselves and they're eating it and it's uh i, I just you know we, we um we have our, our chicken and a lot of people think that the chicken is better for the planet than the cow and it's not <laughs> definitely in my mind our cows are the most the, the, the best thing um and that's not because we make more money out of the cows or anything like that you know we're selling chicken and beef but the beef is the better one environmentally because the chicken still needs grain. People think that they can just live off grass. They can't. They're, they're monogastric. So they've got a different digestion system to a ruminant like a cow. And they can't live off grass alone. And so we have to supplement supplement their feed with, with grains. And the biggest challenge in the poultry, so I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but the biggest challenge with poultry is getting the protein in the diet. And most protein in poultry rations comes from soya, which isn't grown in this country. And a lot of soya has contributed to some pretty devastating things like the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. Um, so a lot of soya is also produced sustainably. But it's a really difficult t- subject. And I go to these meetings where we're talking about alternative uses of protein and you know insect protein and flies and, and the challenges we have in the poultry industry. And I'm sat there thinking cows literally turn grass what we can't eat into the highest quality protein we can eat and they do that without anything needing to come into this country i just sit there thinking why are we even trying to do all these fancy other things just eat beef grass-fed beef really interesting it's i love talking to you about this stuff it's fascinating and how many farmers are thinking in the way that you're thinking it there's more more and more so there's People are seeing that if you manage your pastures differently, um, you can grow more grass with less costs, and so you can become more resilient and more profitable. And so it's it's kind of a win-win for everyone, really. It's better for the animals, it's better for the environment, and it's better for the farmer. So as more people learn and try these different ideas, the more the more um, you know, the more different mindsets are changed, the better, really. Um, yeah, so there's it's it's definitely growing, it's definitely growing, which is great. It's what we want. When yeah. when you were talking earlier, you were talking about your great grandfather, and we've mentioned it's six generations that you're you're working on a, a farm that has been managed for six generations of the same family. Do you have any records or diaries or things? Can you look back and make comparisons? Um, I haven't done, but my um, my granddad's brother, so my great uncle, he was very particular about record keeping, and that he has got records of all the different species of grasses, and and yeah, he he was very into his nature and the hedges and and the insects and things. So there are records there. I just need to dig them out and and have a little read. Um, that would be fantastic. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? <clears throat> They would, yeah, yeah. I mean, his that that was almost like not that long ago in terms of generations, because my granddad 
it was quite ironic, really. We've we've spent the last couple of weeks um, planting more hedges on the farm, and um, it, we were we were kind of reflecting on the fact that we were getting a, a government subsidy, a grant to plant these hedges, that my granddad probably had a government subsidy to pull out after the war, you know, and uh, so he's getting paid to rip them out, and we're getting paid to put them back in. And I just thought it was interesting because actually, when you think about it they were probably both the right decision at the time. At the time, they needed food. There was starvation, and that was what they thought would be the best thing. Now we have learned the, the unintended consequences of taking out these natural habitats, and we're putting them back in. So I think both of them were the right decision, but it's just interesting how, you know, how it's changed. And I'm loving hearing that you're planting hedges as, you know, as part of your rewinding as part of your much more sustainable farm that it's it's such it's such a bigger deal than just putting a chicken on our plate or a slice of beef isn't it you know you really are Mm. you know guardian a guardian of our landscape yeah I just you know just little things a hedgerows that we've already got you know every year we would spend thousands of pounds getting contractors in to come and cut them into nice neat rectangular shapes because as humans we like things neat you know we like our lawns you know cut short and and we like things neat and tidy we don't like weeds and um and now I've said well I kind of want to let these hedges grow and and get big so that they provide more shelter for the livestock and slow the wind down and over the last four like three years we haven't cut them and they've doubled their height and probably doubled their width and they're beautiful now with the blackthorns blossoming and um it's yeah they'll they'll provide shelter for our livestock um and so then the livestock can then be healthier and thrive more so i i just see it as a win-win and we're not having to cut them save money you know the amount of amount of money and fuel used to cut them every year it's just bonkers really i love the way you're thinking I love the way you're talking, and I could talk about all of this all day. You are, where are you in the country, in the UK? We are just south of Bristol, not far from Bristol Airport. Um, and a little hamlet called you Nepnitz presumably Thrubwell. have a, sorry, say that again. In a little hamlet called Nempnit Thrubwell, which I'm sure and is one awards that. for being the most like bizarre name of a village. <laughs> it's... it's. So, and tell us about your website. So if if somebody's listening and they think, right, I would really like to support this kind of farming. I want to order the chicken. I want to even visit for one of those barbecues or I want to order some beef. How can we get hold of you? Yeah, so um, got a little homemade website called Nempnit Pastures. Uh, If you just Google search Nempnit Pastures, even if you don't spell Nempnit right, because not many people do, because the word's so unique, I think Google will ch- take you to the right place anyway. Um, and yeah, on there we you can you can order our our, um, our chicken, beef, and turkey when we've got it available, and we can ship it anywhere in the country really. Um, so because we're all seasonal, um, we just produce chicken through the summer because it wouldn't be ethical to to raise them the way we do through the winter. I mean, we could do ducks the way we do chicken through the winter. That would be great, but not, not oh, chicken. Well, I, was, I saw the spark come on in your eye there. Oh, there's a thought. <laughs> I mean, it's been that wet. Ducks would do really well. Um, yes. So what we do is we, we produce as much as we can in the summer and then we freeze everything um, so that we can try and sell it all year round. But we're running out. We've sold out of whole chickens now. We've just got a few portions and cuts and things. Um, same with the beef because they finish um, on grass that's usually in the summer so we produce a lot through the summer and then we freeze it all um, and then obviously the turkeys are all done all done for Christmas but yeah if you head onto the website um, you can you can either order what we've got left or join the mailing list I don't send loads of emails because no one wants too many emails in their inbox and I haven't got time to send loads of them so whenever we've got fresh uh, fresh stock available or, or for doing an event on the farm um, and I'll usually send out an email then good right I'll be on that mailing list George thank you so much for your time what does the rest of the day hold for you the rest of the day for me I need to go we planted a load of, when we were doing the hedges we planted a load of um, 
individual trees as well on some of the hill ground, just trying to create like a silvo pasture. And um, we planted the trees in as quick as we could. They're only little saplings. And we put one of those kind of plastic tree guards around. But I need to put some proper mesh guards around to stop the cows just pushing them over. So I need to go and get those up a bit quick. That's your job for the rest of the day. Well, thank you for letting us eat into that time. No, it's been a pleasure to talk to you.